Hi, history students. So we finished chapter one. Hopefully you took the test. If you didn't, that was a choice that you made. So you will need to explain that to your parents. Um, but we are moving on to chapter two. Welcome to ancient Egypt. So we're going to be talking about ancient Egypt starting today. Um, I did skip the beginning part of the chapter uh, because we've actually been practicing the skill of predicting through our, um, through our Sasquatch book. So we skipped that part. So we started on page 38. This is just getting ready for the chapter, getting ready for what we're going to read today. Um, it says, what's the connection? In chapter one, you learned about the early civilization in Mesopotamia. At about the same time, another civilization was forming near the Nile River. We call this civilization ancient Egypt. So this is really important to talk about because we've been looking at those uh, timelines where they have multiple levels. And that's because we're talking about different regions, but they're happening at the same time. Okay, so this is a happening about the same time as what we read in chapter one. Okay, all right. So places we will be learning about, we'll be learning about Egypt, the Nile River, the Sahara. We're going to meet Narmer in this chapter. Cataracts we're gonna learn about today. Delta, Papyrus, Hieroglyphics, and Dynasty or Arc. Ooh, try not to go too much. There we go, settling the Nile. Main idea, the Egyptian civilization began in the fertile Nile River Valley where natural barriers discouraged invasions. So in the chapter before, we learned about how the Euphrates and Tigris rivers were the location between those two rivers was the location for their civilization. Now, again, we're looking at a civilization that grew, that grew up um, in a river valley. So we know that river rivers and water are important to life. You learn that in science and fourth grade. Here we are talking about it and how it helped civilization grow as well. All right. Between 6,000 BC and 5,000 BC, hunters and food gatherers moved into the green Nile River Valley from less fertile areas of Africa and Southwest Asia. They settled down, farmed the land, and created several dozen villages along the riverbanks. These people became the earliest Egyptians. A mighty river. Although Egypt was warm and sunny, the land received little rainfall. For water, the Egyptians had to rely on the Nile River. They drank from it, bathed in it, and used it for farming, cooking, and cleaning. The river provided fish and supported plants and animals. To the Egyptians, then, the Nile was a precious gift. They praised it in a song. Hail, O Nile, who comes from the earth, who comes to give life to the people of Egypt. Even today, the Nile inspires awe. It is the world's longest river, flowing north from the heart of Africa to the Mediterranean Sea. This is a distance of some 4,000 miles. Traveling the length of the Nile would be like going from Atlanta, Georgia, to San Francisco, California, and then back again. That's pretty long. The Nile begins as two separate rivers. One river, the Blue Nile, has its source in the mountains of eastern Africa. The other, the White Nile, starts in marshes in Central Africa. The two rivers meet and form the Nile just south of Egypt. There, narrow cliffs and boulders in the Nile, excuse me, form wild rapids called cataracts. So a cataract is a kind of white, white water rafting kind of thing that people do. They call them cataracts. Because of the cataracts, large ships can use the Nile only for its last 650 miles, where it flows through Egypt. A sheltered land. In, De in Egypt, the Nile runs through a narrow green valley. Look at the map below. You can see that the Nile looks like the long stem of a flower. Shortly before the Nile reaches the Mediterranean Sea, it divides into two branches that look like the flowers blossom. These branches fan out all over the area of fertile soil called a delta. So let's look at this map. Okay, so remember, it starts way down here at the bottom and flows north. So this is the Nile Delta where all these little breakouts happen and it's a, a marshy type of area. Notice that there's a desert on the east side and a desert on the west side. Okay, this becomes important later. 
like here's a picture of the Nile River today. Look at all the sailboats, it kind of looks like fun. On both sides of the Nile Valley and its delta, deserts unfold as far as the eye can see. To the west is a vast desert that forms part of the Sahara, the largest desert in the world. To the east, stretching to the Red Sea, is the Eastern Desert. In some places, the change from green land to barren sand is so abrupt that a person can stand with one foot in each. The ancient Egyptians called the deserts the Red Land because of their burning heat. Although these vast expanses could not support farming or human life, they did serve a useful purpose. They kept outside armies away from Egypt's territory, right? Because those armies can't come across, there's not enough water for the horses and the, and the armies to come across that desert. So it made them safe. <clears throat> Other geographic features also protected the Egyptians. To the far south, the Nile's dangerous cataracts blocked enemy boats from reaching Egypt. In the north, the Delta marshes offered no harbors for invaders approaching from the sea. So there was no place to park their boats, basically. In this regard, the Egyptians were luckier than the people of Mesopotamia. In that region, few natural barriers protected the cities. Remember how many times they were taken over by different people? The Mesopotamians constantly had to fight off attackers, but Egypt rarely faced threats. As a result, Egyptian civilization was able to grow and prosper. Despite their isolation, the Egyptians were not completely closed to the outside world. The Mediterranean Sea bordered Egypt to the north, and the Red Sea lay beyond the desert to the east. These bodies of water gave the Egyptians a way to trade with people outside Egypt. Within Egypt, people used the Nile for trade and transportation. Winds from the north pushed sailboats south. The flow of the Nile carried them north. Egyptian villages thus had frequent friendly contact with one another, unlocked the hostile relations between Mesopotamian city-states. The river people. Main idea, the Egyptians depended on the Nile's floods to grow their crops. In chapter one, sorry guys. In chapter one, you learned that the people of Mesopotamia had to tame the floods of the Tigris and Euphrates River in order to farm. They learned to do so, but the unpredictable rivers loomed as a constant threat. Regular flooding. Like the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians also had to cope with river floods. However, the Nile floods were much more dependable and gentle than those of the Tigris and the Euphrates. As a result, the Egyptians were able to farm and live securely. They did not worry that sudden heavy overflows would destroy their homes and crops or that too little flooding would leave their fields parched. Every spring, heavy rains from Central Africa and melting snows from the highlands of East Africa added to the waters of the Nile as it flowed north. From July to October, the Nile spilled over its banks. When the waters went down, they left behind a layer of dark, fertile mud. Because of these deposits, the Egyptians called their land Kemet, or the Black Land. How did the Egyptians use the Nile? The Egyptians took advantage of the Nile's floods to become successful farmers. They planted wheat, barley, and flax seeds in the wet, rich soil. Over time, they grew more than enough food to feed themselves and the animals they raised. One reason for their success was the wise use of irrigation. Egyptian farmers first dug basins or bowl-shaped holes in the earth to trap the floodwaters. The farmers then dug canals to carry the water from the basins to fields beyond the river's reach. The Egyptians also built dikes or earthen banks to strengthen the basin walls. In time, Egyptian farmers developed other technology to help them in their work. For example, they used a shaduf or a bucket attached to a long pole to lift water from the Nile to the basins. Many Egyptian farmers still use this device today. So if we look in this picture here, this is a gentleman filling his bucket of a shaduf. Okay, and then he'll, so you can see the big long stick and they use that to get down to the water. Early Egyptians also developed geometry to survey or measure land. 
When floods washed away boundary markers dividing one field from the next, the Egyptians surveyed the fields again to see where one began and the other ended. Egyptians used papyrus, a reed plant that grew along the Nile, to make baskets, sandals, and river rafts. Later, they used the, excuse me, the papyrus for paper making. They did this by cutting strips from the stalks of the plant. Then they soaked them in water, pounded them flat, dried them, and then joined them together to make paper. What were hieroglyphics? The Egyptians used their papyrus rolls as writing paper. Like the people of Mesopotamia, the Egyptians developed their own system of writing. Originally, it was made up of thousands of picture symbols. Some symbols stood for objects and ideas. To communicate the idea of a boat, for example, a scribe would draw a boat. Later, Egyptians created symbols that stood for sounds, just as the letters of our alphabet do. Combining both picture symbols and sound symbols created a complex writing system that was later called hieroglyphics. So we're going to revisit hieroglyphics somewhere in this chapter, okay? And I'm going to have you practice them. So just um, be prepared for that. In ancient Egypt, few people could read and write. Some Egyptian men, however, went to special schools located at Egyptian temples to study reading and writing and to learn to become scribes. Scribes kept records and worked for the rulers, priests, and traders. Scribes also painstakingly carved hieroglyphics onto stone walls and monuments. For everyday purposes, scribes invented a simpler script and wrote on paint wrote or painted on papyrus. Okay, so here we have a picture, a focus of everyday life, the way it was. So remember when we talk about the way it was, we're talking about the way it was in ancient Egypt. Oh, my lights went out, so hopefully you can see me okay. <sighs> From farming to food, harvesting wheat and turning into bread was vital to the ancient Egyptians. Some people were full-time farmers, but many others were drafted by the government to help during the busy season. The process began as men cut the wheat with wooden stick sickles. Ooh, I lost my page. And women gathered it into bundles. Animals trampled the wheat to separate the kernels from the husks. The grain was then thrown into the air so the wind would carry away the lightweight seed coverings because you don't want to eat the seed coverings, right? Finally, the grain was stored in silos for later use. So we've talked about a whole lot today, but I want to focus on the fact that the river is the main source of life and um, happiness. I don't know that happiness is the right word, but they were able to grow crops, feed their people, bathe, all of those things because of the regular flooding of the Nile River. So in today's assignment, you're going to be revisiting that map from earlier back so we can kind of look at it. So you're going to be looking at this map okay, in closer detail and I've asked you some questions. Um, please be aware that you will need to use the reading from today and the map both to answer the questions. So not all of the questions are from the map. Some of them are from the reading. So please use both of those things to answer the questions. So again, welcome to Ancient Egypt. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye, guys.